Where are you based? Chicago. City or suburbs? Suburbs. You fucking liar. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Fueled by Impact. Today's episode is brought to you by my new book called Coach's Plan, the personal productivity system that changed my life. Mike, what business do you have doling out personal productivity advice? You know, imaginary person who just asked me that? It's a great question. I am the last person who expected to write a book like this. Trust me. But I felt like I had to because I was in a big time rut. This approach unexpectedly came into my life and it launched me into the richest period of my life. Not just with respect to productivity, but also with respect to personal habit change more broadly. So the bottom line is, I think it can help people. Genuinely, I think it can help people. And the investment is super low. Super short book, built for busy people. It takes about an hour to read or listen to. So for about the cost of a cup of coffee, even if this gives you one amazing week, even just one amazing day, it's paid back. So the best way to find this book is going to mikecav.com, M-I-K-E-K-A-V.com. It's going to link you to all the right places, depending on the format you like to consume your books. Thank you, sponsor, for supporting this show. Now let's get down to business. I am beyond excited to introduce today's guest to you, Sam Lamott. Sam is a single dad, college dropout, ex-meth head who came out of a 10-year bender at the age of 22 with severe clinical depression, a two-year-old, and zero life skills. Simply put, there is nobody more genuinely curious about how to be a human being. The story doesn't end there. Sam is also the founder of HelloHumans.co. He is a creator and host of the How To Human podcast. The How To Human podcast is literally my favorite of all podcasts, all 2.2 trillion of them and counting, which actually is quite a feat. When I discovered it, I consumed every single episode over the span of like four days. Anyway, enough of me. I feel so grateful to have him on my show. Please give a warm welcome to the incredible Sam Lamont. Sam, thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, I'll tell the audience, I got an email that was a YouTube link, and it was a video of Mike basically saying he he appreciates what I do and would love me to be on his show, and I loved it. I, I could tell I could tell you're a really interesting but wholesome person from the get-go. That could be a misread, wow. but I was a drug dealer, so I feel like I am a pretty <laughs> good judge of character. Uh, so I'm grateful That's to be impressive. here. Thanks for having me, Mike. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. I am grateful to have you. I totally spoke from the heart there. I mean, your show, and I will, I've already introduced you to everybody, but uh, How to Human podcast is, I mean, it's hands down my favorite show. And I'm not just saying that to, to be sort of flattering a guest here. I mean, I, I think anytime something can kind of make you laugh or and cry and and I was learning things and I actually took action you know I like bought some of these people's books or I adjusted the way that I was living I discovered new people who were amazing people who I never would have discovered before and so I just think it's been it's been a real gift and you've had so many just very deep conversations I think you have a a gift at, at having those types of conversations with people and getting a lot out in a short period of time so so yeah, I thank you for what you do, and I want more people to discover it as well. I'm I'm honored. It's still funny to hear people listening to what I'm doing on my own and appreciating it, or wanting to hear my thoughts on their shows. So it's it's very cool. I I'm honored and touched and uh, grateful to be a part of your program, and I'm happy to have played a, a small role in you discovering awesome people who I also think were awesome, which is why they were on the show. Yeah. Well, I've got, I'm going to kick us off with a question. I don't know if the, uh, if the podcast gods will frown upon me, but Sam, this could be as big or as small of a question as you want to make it, but who are you? This is sacrilege. This is my opening question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) 
I, I would say, who am I is the question that surrounds how I want to live my life. And I want to live my life discovering that. I think that as humans, we have a time. Like, so you, you might say that you're an American. I actually don't know if you're an American. You're an American or you live in the Bay Area like I do or you're an earthling. But I think more than anything, you're a, a temporal being. You belong to a time. And my time is 1989, current era, to potentially 2071. Is that, is that what I thought it was? I think that's my, my 82 years projected lifetime. And today is day 11,717 of my life. And I may get to live 30,000 days. So what do you do when you realize that you have a limited amount of time here? I, th I think part of that is to get to learn who you are. You're a lot more than what you've become during your life. You're a collection of ancestral knowledge, you know, the genetics that helped make you and the culture that came before you. And then you're this person that lives a life. And I've been around for 32 years. A lot has happened in those 32 years. I am. I always feel like, man, I have lived way more in 32 years than most people. But I imagine I'll, that's the way everyone feels too. <laughs> you know, it's like when you're in the driver's seat and you're experiencing everything, it's a lot. So these 32 years here have been a lot. And the question of who I am is, it's not something that I need to answer. That's not why I'm curious um, about it. But it is. It is. If, I, if you follow that, if you treat this experience as trying to figure out who you are, I think just the journey of that being the prompt for how to live is to get to learn who you are. Uh, I think that's not uh, a wasted life. I think that's actually an incredible way to live. So who am I? I think it helps to start with a superficial. I'm a man. I identify as a man, and I have high hopes for the, the, the men coalition you know i um i want that to mean something really good one day which you know some days i feel like there are great expressions of men all over the place and other days i don't that changes i'm an artist i like to make things i've made things for money and i've made things just because they're a hobby of mine and it doesn't change much i like to take things from, from here, my mind, and to like what a friend of mine would call the imaginal realm and translate them into the physical world. So it can be anything as simple as, oh, I don't have anything within reach. Oh, here we go. Like these are our um, booking checklists. If you're watching on video, you can see. And they're, they're quite organized. And I, I made them and cut them out and laminated them. And they make a cool product. You could probably sell these. I'm not going to sell them, but I liked making them a lot. So I'd say I'm an artist. I'm a creator. I think when people refer to the higher power as our creator, I think that's a great inspiration is that we have an ability to make things. And whether you're good at it or bad at it, I think it's a really cool skill to work on. I'm a dad. I'm a, I was a teen dad. I'm a college dropout. I'm an ex meth head. I've had a, long chunk of my life be dedicated purely to selfish <laughs> drinking and using and escaping this reality, which now I've been 10 years clean and sober. So my using time and my clean time are neck and neck right now. And it's been, it's been interesting to, to get to experience the human experience completely sober, feel all the feelings and really be in the driver's seat and you know that that includes experiencing all the the harder parts of life too so i'm a feeler i'm a sensitive person and i'm really curious about what it means to be human what it means to be a conscious self-aware being that came out of non-existence and is now inhabiting conscious existence. So that's a very convoluted way to answer your question. 
Well, it's a convoluted way to answer your question, but <laughs> I'll take it. How do you think about doing that? Like, what is it just through life itself, or are there things that you proactively do or ways that you found are helpful to get underneath that question, that discovery process? I think intentionality is a big part of not a big part of being here because you don't have to be intentional, but I think it's an amazing opportunity to do things intentionally. We as humans can get into habits and rhythms and kind of programs really easily. And there's a good reason. I think it saves energy. It saves time. It might be lower stress if you just know you're going to wake up and have a smoothie every day and then take a shower. But I think examining things and doing things intentionally, well, yeah, it might use more calories or it might present more questions that might stress you out. I, I think there's a lot to be discovered there. And there's, you know, I believe in regular check-ins, regular inventories where I go, wait a second, why, why am I doing that? You know, why, why, um, why do I watch TV every night before I go to bed when I know I sleep better without the TV? That's a question I'm examining right now. It's quite <laughs> painful to try to sleep without background noise. Uh, it's just hard. It's like uh, when I get quiet and it's dark, uh, that's when all the, that's when the mind really has some fun with me. You know, when my imagination can really think about all the things going wrong in my life. And um, I would like to get to a point to where I can go to bed without a distraction and then get to experience my dreams deeper, which happens. I think intentionality goes a lot further than it does at first glance. And I think that the things you'll discover when you do things intentionally will not necessarily make you better than the person who isn't, but I think it will make your experience of this time way more full. Can you take me back to the decision to pursue Hello Humans full-time? Can you talk to me a little bit about that decision process and where you were at the time and what caused you to, to pursue things in the way that you have? Yeah, I mean, so when you talk about origin stories, um, eventually the true origin becomes a myth. And it gets mythologized. So I will tell you one of the myths of the origin story, because what happened, I'm sure, has a lot that won't get included here. But um, essentially, I had really believed I had something creative to bring to the world for about four years working for another company. And the company started to go under, and I got let go. Or what do you, what do you call it when you're downsizing? It's not fired. It's something else. Laid off. Laid off. I got laid off. I had one of and those. Like I know you know about. <laughs> <laughs> we have that in common. And I had this moment of time where I just thought, I was blogging at the time, and I just thought, if you don't try it right now during this unemployed time, you're going to go get another job and complain for four years that you have something inside you that wants to come out. So I dove in head first, and um, when I got tired of blogging, there's a little bit of an audience and I didn't want to lose these awesome people. So I thought, what else could I give them that would maybe be more enjoyable? And I, I love podcasts and I just thought I can do this. And I think, um, I think I'm allowed to say at this point, like I'm good at it. You know, I'm a good interviewer. I'm a curious person and I know you're not supposed to toot your own horn, but it's just what's true. I, I know when I interview people, I can pull things out of them that weren't said in other interviews that are important to them and their story. So I think it's symbiotic. It's not just getting great guests, but it's also creating a space for them to share things that they haven't quite shared yet. And so I created the podcast. Now, you know, looking back on it, I wish I had kept some kind of sustainable income as well. Like if I could do it over again, I might keep a part-time job or have a part-time job all the way through because the, 
this has been a labor of love. There's been times when the podcast makes good money. There's been times when the podcast is just a money pit. Um, and the, the pressure it puts on my creative output is a bummer. And so, I don't know. I, I think that there's a, a romanticism that comes about diving in head first and taking this big risk. I don't think it's necessary to get what I got out of the creative process. I think that mm. if you can work four days a week and dedicate Fridays or dedicate Mondays or dedicate a day to doing your thing, I think you're going to get a lot out of it too. And so I don't want your listeners or my listeners, if they're checking out your show to come away with a message that they need to do something drastic and manic to experience what I've experienced by creating something of my own, by taking something from the imaginal realm and bringing it into the physical world. Because I think it's bullshit. And I'm very grateful that I'm in the position that I'm in and that I'm doing this. I'm doing this with my best friend who happens to be brilliant and talented. So it's not just friends working together, but it truly is somebody who I want to work with. And what a blessing for us to meet Monday through Thursday and, and work together. But what I've gotten out of this journey is to do it. There's not going to be a part of me that wishes I had done it because I did the work and that work has been incredibly hard. I've taken a year and a half off most recently because it was just not working. It was not working for my mental health. It was not working for my physical health. And I needed to a heal. And I saw lots of doctors. I got my hormones in the right place. Uh, you know, there's like physical problems that were happening and I worked on my mental health. And then I thought, for a long time about what I could do differently with good thinkers, with therapists and with mentors. And what ended up happening is I got asked to be on a construction project. I'm, I'm a good carpenter. I would say I'm a decent carpenter. <laughs> we won't go to good, but I have carpentry skills. And somebody asked me to um, put a new facade on their house. And I showed up and I was, I was working with three or four people and I had, energy and I, I felt great and you know I thought about this with my therapist for a long time and he thought you know maybe it's just that you're not supposed to be alone when you work like maybe for the only child of a single mother who is incredibly busy maybe working alone in your cave your studio is not the best plan and so I called I called Reese and Reese had also gotten laid off, you know, so that's oh, how about that. <laughs> yep. We are all in the laid off club and uh, I'm going to put them on for a second. So your people watching it can see that's Reese. Great man. And, um, I said, <laughs> so you don't have a job right now. Would you be willing to be poor with me for a couple of years and give this a shot? Cause I don't want to return by myself. You know, I, I want to do this as a as a tribe and I, I don't want to produce a podcast to release into the digital black hole anymore. I want to start to try to collect people. And Mike, you're invited to our book club tonight if you want. Um, yeah, I saw that and I, uh, I get the emails. I am a, I am a subscriber. <laughs> Good. And, and that is so far, I think, you know, we've been into this for six months coming back, including prep time, maybe longer. Um, so far it's working a lot better. And so this tiny little shift, it's making a big difference and it's a, it's a refocus, you know, rather than, Hey, we just got 50,000 listeners. Cool. I remember when I noticed that the podcast had had a, a million downloads, it just felt so empty, you know, like what did I have? Well, what I had was some notes from listeners who I really loved. And I've kept all of them. I've gotten a couple suicide notes from people who had written out a note to their loved ones and then heard something they heard on the show and went and got help. That's awesome. But the number itself, the sheer mass number, this thing that I've been chasing, which is lots of listeners, was misaligned. 
And I think what I'm after now is like a thousand true fans or friends or community members that there is a dialogue between and then the the podcast, which will go out broader. So sometimes I think about what you want might not be what you want. You know, so it let's say if you are if you want to date a really rich partner, like that's just what you're attracted to, which there's nothing wrong with that. You know, some people want to date beautiful people, some people want to date rich people. That's okay. But but so why, why is that really? I think when you go beneath the surface, you might discover things. So you might realize that you just want to feel safe and secure. And so maybe it's not necessarily just lots of physical money, which, you know, it's nothing wrong with having lots of money or wanting lots of money. But maybe it's not about the money itself. And so I think for me, it's not about being loved on a large scale. I think it's about being appreciated intimately with some people that I wouldn't have connected with otherwise. And that's what's cool about starting to try these communal events. I think it's going to go very slow. I really do. I think on tonight's book club, I think there might be like two or three or four or five people. Um, but that interaction is... I'm more excited about that than releasing another podcast on Monday that's, I don't know, five, ten, twenty thousand 20,000 people will listen to, but it won't nourish me in any way. So the myth is I got laid off. I jumped into this podcast headfirst bravely, and it took off like a meteor, and my life was complete. But but none of that is is really the truth. You know, the truth is it's been a struggle. I think working for myself has challenged me spiritually, emotionally, mentally more than working for a corporation. I think it's a lot easier for me to be spiritually well when I have um, a paycheck every two weeks and I know how much I'm going to make and I can have things come up and bills come up. And um, to find spiritual wellness in this uncertainty has been an amazing exercise. I don't think it's a necessary one. I don't think you have to learn how to be well in uncertain, horrible, strenuous times. But um, it's been a journey. And for now, it's a journey I'm, I'm curious to keep following. There's a, a lot that resonates with me just in terms of my own journey this sort of solo life, <laughs> which is where things have started for me. But I think what you said about you don't, it doesn't have to look like diving in head first where I myself have, have come around to is seeing how much I really need to be able to feed those parts that weren't being fed before. And it, and it doesn't necessarily have to look like something that's, that's full time. Um, granted, I also understand because I've been there. If you're working a very intense job, sometimes it is taking all your best hours and it, and it really is that people can say hustle to the cows come home, but it's not necessarily possible. Sometimes you have a family and a really intense job and that, you know, it's, it's hard to eke out more than a couple hours a week on something. Not that you shouldn't still start there. Do you have a family, Mike? I do. Yeah, so you're not on the, the grind path. That would be a horrible decision is to start grinding yeah. and working yeah. 12 hours a day. So one day you maybe can pay for them to get good therapy for you being gone. So <laughs> right. if, you're, if you're talking to me to, to learn something, I mean, I'm, I'm also hoping I learned something from you too. We're definitely friends now. But if you could learn something from me, it would be to figure out a way to do this safely and, and not to feel less than as a creator. Our society tells you like, Oh, you're a full-time artist. You must be a better artist. You got to let that go. You have to let that go. Let's find you some company or organization that wants to pay you for three days a week or four days a week. And they know that they can use your talents even though it doesn't fit what they might want for their job opening. And then you dive in 
Fridays and you, you invite somebody else in and it becoming less about this growing into something monetarily successful, which may or may not happen. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know that for myself. I definitely don't know that for you, but turn it into something that the experience itself is rewarding. So inviting somebody who you love and just say, Hey, do you want to, you want to be one day poorer with me on Fridays and we'll do this. And when we're 80 years old, sitting on a porch, playing a game of chess, we can talk about those five years we were creating really cool conversations and that this one person in Alberta wrote us and told us that they really appreciated a conversation we helped host. Here's a good analogy I use all the time. A buddy, Bruce and I decided to go on a camping trip. And we had no idea where we were going to go. We didn't have any campgrounds booked. We packed my Subaru Baja, which had a little four-foot truck bed full of camping gear. And we brought a physical map of California and two hits of acid. I was still using at the time. And, um, and that was it. Now, when we were driving, we just decided to just start going north. While we were driving, we had no idea where we were going to end up. It's a perfect analogy for creative endeavors. You have no idea where you're going to end up. Because of that, because there was no goal, we knew that maybe on the first night we were going to end up at a really sketchy trailer park or we might end up somewhere just terrible. We might have to use that 500 bucks to get a hotel room because we just failed. Because of that, every stretch of the road that was beautiful, we noticed. You had to be hyper aware that the drive might be the best part of the experience because you might end up somewhere shit. We ended up at the Lost Coast. It was great. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, we followed this dotted line on the map, which is supposed to be off-road, but it was paved. And we're going, why is this mislabeled on the map? And it was one of those towns where the locals tear down the signs and kind of don't want you to find it. But we found it. It was beautiful. But the point is, is that you, we were forced into a different way of traveling because we didn't have a fixed destination. There was not like, ah, oh, don't, don't mind this horrible, laborsome drive because you're going to end up here and then you'll be in, in heaven, in the Garden of Eden, and all of it will be worth it. Terrible. <laughs> what a terrible way to make yeah. art, I think, you know, or to, yeah. to make, um, to do your soul work. I think you have to find a way to make the journey the experience because you have no idea where you're going to end up. I have no idea if uh, Reese and I will be interviewing for jobs like Dumb and Dumber um, together in four years. And we'll just go, you know what? Like, let's just find a job that'll hire us both. I have no idea. What I do know is that I'm writing things down. When we have interesting days, I write it down. I take a photo. I print that photo out. I put it in my journal. And this chunk of time is incredible. It might be the most rewarding chunk of time as a professional I've ever had. And the time in the past before my most re recent mental breakdown delay, when I was making good money, when I was booking the biggest guests I've ever had while I was having the most engagement was not. What's most rewarding is doing this with another human being as a social animal, part of a herd. You know, I have a little two-person herd now. We both have our strengths and weaknesses. We love spending time together. We love that. We both know it might not be our retirement plan. Um, and so we take pictures of the funny moments and the funny days. Like uh, Reese did something. I forget what it was. How did you break the internet? What did you send? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He, so Reese used to write funny uh, captions um, in the rough drafts of what was supposed to go on the social media. And uh, he, he accidentally posted one. Thankfully, it didn't have anything, you know, that would have gotten us canceled. But it was just like he posted something prematurely and we were just like, oh, my God, what have you done? And so we we made a, a page in our journals that says, like, Reese breaks the Internet, you know, or uh, <laughs> went to, um Reese uh, borrowed one of our memory cards and uh, accidentally formatted it. And I, I, like an idiot, never, you know, back up my memory cards. Like, I'm not the person who goes and takes photos 
and then comes home and downloads the images. So it was like two years <laughs> of stuff. So we had to download um, all kinds of software that was used to like recover damaged storage drives. We ended up getting it all back. But so these funny moments are the process. They, they are the journey and they are what is valuable here. Because when I die, my son will probably remember what I did. Maybe by the time I'm dead, maybe out of the, let's say I keep going for a while, maybe out of the millions of people who listen to an episode, there'll probably be like a, a thousand maybe at most who like really remember an episode and really it meant something to them. It made them go read a book. It made them reevaluate, reevaluate their life. But two generations from now, no way. You know, so many people are creating so many things. Uh, this is my experience. And I choose to use my experience to share my experience. That seems to be rewarding to me to create a podcast and to, you know, I'm, I'm writing and to share that on a broader level. I also have writings and creative things that I have loved keeping to myself. Like my, my daily journal is going to be such a treasure trove for whoever is going through my things after I die. It's just going to be amazing. And I, I don't feel like ah, I need to share that. You know, I don't need uh, social internet points off that. I'm just excited enough doing it every day. So this is, I think, really where it's at. Is what, I, what I'm trying to sell you on is a different way to think about the show that you're doing. You know, in the same yeah. way that you have to get really good at accepting rejections, uh, which if you haven't got already, you will. <laughs> yeah. uh, for every guest that I book, um, 10 say no. And I have a decent pitch. You know, I have a decent pitch. I can say, look at these <laughs> amazing people I've had my show. And they still say no. So um, you have to make that part of the process. So my invitation to you, Mike, is to not suffer while you do this for an eventual goal one day, but to make this something that is like almost a treat. Granted, work is work. Creative work isn't that much more fun than not creative work. Uh, like if you're making the show for a living, there's a lot of stuff we have to do to get a show out that we hate doing. We hate writing Instagram captions. We hate it. How do you how do you do that? You know, it just seems so self-congratulatory and like, ugh. but we do it. We do it because maybe somebody's on Instagram who wasn't going to listen to the podcast and now they are. And maybe one of those people might decide to help support us so we can keep doing this through Patreon. Patreon.com slash how to human. Glad to see you there. Book club tonight. Oh, wait. Well, this won't go out today. There'll be another book club <laughs> in the future. Um, so there'll be stuff that you don't like doing. But to overall make it something where you're not suffering, there's like a huge social cultural connection between like good work and suffering and like being deserving of good things because you suffered for them. I don't think we need to have that. I really don't. I think that you can set aside the next two years or three years and just say, yeah, I'm going to get an episode out every two weeks and that's going to take uh, a day and a half of work every week to do. And I don't know what I'm going to find. I might make a new best friend. You know, I might meet a future co-host of a new creative project that just has more bite than your current show. Um, I'm working on another show right now, recent IR. It might have more bite, even though I love the super deep dive of how to human it might have more shareability factor. I don't, People don't love sharing my podcast, I don't think. It's, it's so intimate. It's like, hello, are you completely broken and damaged? Here's a show <laughs> you'll like. Um, so, and me doing the deep dive over and over and over again might not be perfect for me either. So it might be that we do some deep dive and we do some uh, levity. Yeah, that's my invitation to you is to, is to rethink, since you're early on and moldable, that's... That's what I could impart. You know, I've been doing this for three years or more, four years. I don't know. That's that's what I'd want to share with you. That's great. I love it. You know, part of my motivation in, you know, it's not just the show. It's sort of like the total slash career package right now 
I had my own struggle of a journey career wise to find something that felt enjoyable. And that was a, that has been a big journey for me and I've explored it. <laughs> I mean, I wrote a book about it. Like I'm, i this is how deeply I care and think about this particular issue and also looking at, Hey, life is short and, and, you know, I want to really love what I do. Um, I've heard you mention that you thought about death a lot as a child. And that was something that was interesting to me because I often think that, you know, not in a morbid way, I, but I think about that more than probably anybody I know. And I'd just be curious to hear you talk about how you have approached that. Yeah. I, I don't know if everyone can do this, but I know plenty can because I brought this up. There is a way for me to meditate on what it would possibly be like to die where I can, for a brief moment, conceptually grasp that I will no longer be thinking or conscious. I don't believe necessarily in a heaven or an afterlife. But so I, I think about that. Like, wow, there is, and it hits me in the gut. It is the scariest thing on the planet. I think it has gotten a lot easier over over time. But I am also, you know, I think about death every day. It's It's the way I like to start my day. And I understand this might not be great for everyone. I have a serial number stamp that counts up one every time you stamp it. it. Tells me what day on planet Earth I am at. I've gathered that the average lifespan for an American man right now is 77 years. I think I'm pretty healthy. I think I got at least 82, 82 years, um, which I've rounded up to 30,000 days. So I know about where on my life I am. And I think for me, I'm, you know, I'm not doling out prescriptions to everyone, but for me, it's helpful. It's helpful to be aware that there is a year where I won't exist anymore. It's helpful for me to know that my time here is limited and that if I am going to use my time to something that is pretty valuable, you know, not, I'm not like super anxious about it. I, I, veg out every night, watch some fun escapism television or, or movie. It's pretty guilt free, you know. I don't think that's like every second of your life has to be productive. But I think you should be aware that you are using something that is finite. And not that yeah, not that you have to go into some manic Let's make the most out of every moment. But just to just to hold that thought that this is, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that I've been working on with my girlfriend or with Reese or with anybody who uh, annoys me from time to time is, you know, wow, I'm, I'm really annoyed by this. Will it annoy me in 24 hours? Will it annoy me in three days or a week or a month? Uh, just to quickly consider contextualized it in time like how because in the moment it can feel this is the biggest slap in the face ever my girlfriend's late it just feels like you have betrayed me um i don't tend to feel as self-righteously angry about that the next day and so if i can quickly kind of realize like hey are you going to spoil the next three hours together being upset about her being 15 minutes late or knowing that this just isn't going to have the same hit tomorrow, maybe you skip that part. That's something I'm actively working on. I haven't mastered this by any chance, but you know, I I do think that learning how to be more kind and more patient, more stoic in some ways, more of a kind of benevolent figure in the people's lives around me that's a fun process to do um that's something that i think is worth my time here is you know for people to as i come into their life if if i meet a barista if i meet a server if i talk to the person at the gas station because the card didn't read am i am i a force that is enjoyable or makes their 
lives more tolerable or at least doesn't contribute to their lives being harder. That seems like a good way to use my time. How do I get kinder to the people who I interact with every day? How do I remember to tell Reese how incredible he is? How do I remember how to tell my girlfriend, Georgie, how incredible she's doing given the stuff on her plate? It's not easy, but it's worth the time, I think. So, yeah, I think about death a lot. I've been to the underworld. I truly believe that. Um, When I read Greek myths or Nordic myths or Celtic myths or the Christian myths, (laughs) I just said that to be a shit. Uh, But I do, I do read um, the Bible. I do, I I look at the Bible as a, a collection of what people thought was most important at that time, at that place. And I think that there's a lot of good lessons in there if you uh, really read it, not if you you know, listen to, I don't think it's very helpful to listen to um, let, let, at least a lot of versions of it, but to actually go to the source material, to look at the archetypes, to try and listen to what they're saying. Um, when I hear about stories of the underworld or stories about the, the afterlife, you know, the paradise, I really believe they're here. I believe, like, uh, I think it was Shakespeare said, like, the angels and demons are here. You're you're either neutral or an angel or a demon. You might literally walk around in a, what Christians call, demonic way to everyone around you. Do you want to be that person? Do you want to learn how to be more kind and patient, tolerant, and not to take things so personally? You know, um, so I've been a meth addict. I have hurt people physically and emotionally. I have been to the underworld. I have met what Christians would call Satan or a satanic force. And I have crawled my way back out. And some moments of many days, I am in paradise. I am in a beautiful place surrounded by people who love me, who would be hard to move away from. I have roots in this world. Where, where there are people who I would live in Antarctica if it meant we could all be together. And um, I think that's here. I think that's to be built here. I don't think there's something I can't say because it involves my, my best friend and uh, can't give it away yet. But hmm. um, when I think about what I think about, like, What is that higher power? What is God? I don't believe God has hands. When when somebody tells me this horrible thing is happening and I need help, I don't say, dear being of the universe, please help this person in my stead. I say, how can I be your hands? How can I operate as I would want God to come in here. You know, can we gather people up? Can, can we put boots on the ground? Can we do something? I do not believe there's a higher power that has hands. I believe, if anything, we are the hands of the higher power. Your hands. Everybody goes, oh my gosh, I wish the world was like this or like that. They post about it on social media. And then it's like, it, it's supposed to be like someone else's job. You know, like, like someone else should go do that. I yeah. I wish um, there weren't so many foster kids. Great. Can you make room in your life to foster a kid? That sounds amazing. Can you get your religious group to, to help you subsidize that? Uh, if you want your neighborhood to be better, can you go to the city council meetings? Can you get those flower pots planted? Can you have a group of people who somebody, one of the group shows up one day a week for three hours with a garbage can and a trash claw and just picks up some trash or sweeps the sidewalks. It's like everyone's looking for someone else to do the job that they're supposed to be doing. So we're way off topic, (laughs) but I think I'm going to die. I think that there is an end to this car in, incarnation of Sam. Some days I'm more okay with that than others. Um, 
I'd like to spend more of my time learning how to be Sam and how to be the Sam that I feel like I am when I look to like, who is the best version of myself? I'd like to spend more time being that than worried about not being this one day. Yeah, me too. Not Sam. I mean, but (laughs) Mike, (laughs) that's great. I love it. Yeah. And I have horrible clinical depression, by the way, there are just times that are not enjoyable. I still think every morning is a good morning or every day is a good day. Not because of how I feel like fuck my feelings. They could just be off, but because it is an opportunity to do good things. You know, uh, the quickest way out. I, <laughs> one of the fun things my girlfriend and I do is uh, we'll tell each other fairy tales or, or stories. And then the other person has to try and use archetypes to create some kind of greater meaning of what the, what the story was trying to tell. Do you know the story of Rumpelstiltskin? Yeah. Right. So um, we'll just skip ahead. There is a part where because this woman has accepted the help of this creature, she's now in, indebted to him and he wants her firstborn child, which to me, I, I, I hear firstborn child, that's your future. Right, That's what she has given up. She has put her future at risk, her future child, to accept this help from this being who we don't know the name of, or she doesn't know the name of, who's Rumpled Silskin. He basically says, hey, look, I will let you off the hook if you can guess my name. You have three days to do it. It's hopeless. It is absolutely hopeless, like life is. Like life is hopeless at many points in many dimensions if you look at some of the problems that face us. Uh, how does she solve the problem? She goes around helping her animals, at least in the story I was told. And while she's helping her animals, she's kind of following them, one hurt animal to one hurt animal, and she sees Rumpled Stiltskin, who thinks he's alone, talking to himself, and she hears his name. It's so brilliant if you look at it at that level because that is, I believe, the quickest way out of suffering. When I'm suffering, it is to help people. I was feeling miserable miserable. And, uh, I turned to Reese and I said, what do you need? What are the chores you need to run today? We're not getting any good work done today. I need to do something nice for you. He happens to be really bad at accepting help or, uh, advice. So he was kind of like, I don't know what chores do you have to do? You know, let's just make this a kind of catch up day for, you know, kind of DMV appointment stuff that we need to do. And, uh, I had, he had been talking about something that he wanted and we had gone to a snore and I had sneaky moused away, got him this thing. It was a, a butane soldering iron and I gave it to him. I felt so much better. I felt so much better. You know, if, um, if you have a friend who has a newborn and you're feeling miserable, go offer to do their dishes. That's, that's something that uh, Mandy Statmiller recommended to me. And that's a, that's a great one. You know, somebody who's underwater or, you know, somebody who's behind on their taxes, go, go offer to help them when you're miserable. It's not for them as much as you might think. It's, it's really for you. It's the quickest way out of suffering. That's great. I love it. So I'm conscious of time. Um, I really, I appreciate that you've taken all the time that you have on that, on this, uh, little show of mine. And, um, I have like 42 other questions I would ask you, <laughs> We can meet again too. That would be awesome. I would love that. Give me some some high level version. I want to know what I'm looking forward to. I'm curious, and I don't know how much you talk about um, your experiences as a parent. Oh, we can make an hour out of that, definitely. Well, we'll have to do that. Um, so I guess to, ter- to try to put a bow on on this conversation, which I've enjoyed so much, you've probably already said you know several different things in our conversation that could could be your answer to this. If you would just go back to any one of those periods where you felt you were in a low point and you could get through to yourself in that moment, what would you say? Yeah. Mike, do you want to host the Housey Human podcast? (laughs) (laughs) 
I was trying not to warn anybody that I was going to rip you off, but I figured this is the be- best way to bookend it, right? I there's a I like my format, and you are more than welcome to use it. Um, so this is what I'm saying. Hey, dude, it's me, future you. I want you to know that what you're going through right now must feel like the end of the world, and it's gonna get so much worse. It's going to be so much more terrible in the future. You are going to have things that feel like they're going to break you. And I know this feels like it's going to break you. This is not even as bad as it gets. But let me tell you one thing. You make it through. You keep going. Sometimes you're crawling because you can't run. But there's another side to this. You will love again. You will be happy again. You will have friendships that that fill you up again. This is not the end yet. So keep going. And if you have to, you can sit in it. You don't have to do anything right now. But I just want you to know that this isn't the end and to keep going. And please continue to work out so you don't get fat at 32. (laughs) Sam Lamott, I appreciate this so much. This has been a real pleasure. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you again for for doing this. I'm honored to be here and I look forward to our parenting discussion. (laughs) Well, thank you again and uh, take care. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Until next time. Usually this would be the time that I ask you to support the show by reviewing or sharing. And those are still great things to do. But I got a sponsor this week and it's the book Coach's Plan. One hour, one cup of coffee. This little book We'll take that tiny investment and give it back to you a dozenfold, maybe a hundred, maybe a thousandfold. I mean, I haven't done the math. I recognize this sounds like a sales pitch. I guess technically it is a sales pitch, but it's also true because I wouldn't just say that it is the productivity system that changed my life unless I meant it. And I mean it. You can easily find this book by just going to mikecav.com. M-I-K-E-K-A-V.com. It'll link you to all the right places. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing.